We made this. Welcome to episode 99 of Pick a Disc. I'm your host Matt Latham and this is the podcast where someone picks a disc to talk about for whatever reason they want to. And today we're going to be welcoming on Keith Higgins from the Abandoned Albums podcast to talk about Broken Homes, self-titled debut, uh, Broken Home. That's what self, yeah, that's what self-titled is. It's the same name as the band. You know, you, you should know this by now. I think we've done a couple of them. Uh, I can't think of any on top of my head, but yeah, you know, that's how self-titled debuts work. But yeah, and yeah, we talk about the album, we talk about the songs. If you've listened to the past 98 episodes, you know how the thing works. But for anyone who's new and listening, what we do, we talk about the album, we talk about the songs and the stories around it, including one particular interesting big tidbit which um, Keith goes into about how much the Brogan Holmes debut album is a key component in the genesis of the Abandoned Albums podcast. And it was a really interesting conversation. And just interesting about how he talks about it and how much it means to him and just exactly how he views it. And it's just like one of those conversations that I really like having um, on this podcast. And talking about this podcast, if you like what you're listening, feel free to follow us on all the social medias that we have. You follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram under Pick a Disc. It's also a Discord that you can join and just pop in, say hello, and just tell us what you've been listening to. And with that, um, I can't think of anything else to say apart from that you've got one conversation left until episode 100. So this is the last double-digit episode, as I will explain to Keith in a few moments. So let's talk to Keith. Just to warn you, Keith, this, this will be episode 99. So uh, you're going to have the, so you're, you're having the penultimate before my big celebration, <laughs> so my big celebration of, my celebration of product, productivity. So um, yeah, you're on the oh. precipice of, almost, you're almost on almost the, the milestone. Nah, so, uh, that's a great threshold. Congratulations. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'll give you a bit warning now, just in case I completely forget uh, when this airs, I'll completely forget to... Uh, in my excitement for reaching 100, I might accidentally forget to uh, promote this episode. So if I do, and I'm having this on record, feel free just to poke me. Oh, oh rest assured, <laughs> yeah, I will. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've gone from 98 to 100. Where's that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, feel free to poke me. If anyone's listening as well, um, if anyone's listening, just feel free to like poke me and just remember that 99 is still a number. Um, yeah, I've got Keith from the Abandoned Albums podcast as my guest today to be a disc. How you doing, Keith? You okay? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. You're good, yeah. Coming live, coming live from Connecticut. Uh, I don't think I've had any guests from Connecticut um, in the Tri-State area, which is great because I just remember you just told me that <laughs> off recording, <laughs> so uh, I still I'm retaining information. But um, yeah, I mean, US geography will be great to talk about, but we're not here to talk about no. the states in New York. We're here to talk about music and an album that you've picked. So, Keith, wouldn't you tell the listeners the disc that you've picked for us today? It is the debut album by a band called Broken Homes came out in 1986. Yeah, and it's the self-titled debut. Self-titled debut album on MCA Records. Yeah. So why have you picked this album? Oh, oh, a slew of different reasons. Um, It is, it was when it came out, one of my favorite records, and it remains one of my favorite records. I still listen to it at least twice a month in its entirety. But of course, this is a shorter album. It's not the 72 minutes that albums are these days this is eight songs like 40 minutes tops but length isn't relevant the songs are what's relevant it's just a great record it's an interesting case study in excellence gone awry or ignored mm-hmm. and and this is the album that was the impetus for the abandoned albums podcast oh okay okay yeah going in for discussion of an album that you love alongside a bit of kind of promo at the same time i mean <laughs> yeah yeah you, you, yeah you also say that and you can't listen you can't see the webcam listeners but he's also drinking from a mug with the abandoned albums <laughs> that's absolutely <laughs> true the, um, the album. Uh, yeah it's just i have loved this album for so long and the songs have never got what have almost 40 years now 36 years it's just never gotten old. It still sounds fresh. 
<laughs> I almost can feel like it's my mission to carry this album out to the world. Even now, I still fight upstream, but I just think it's a great record. It's just honestly, it's one of my favorite records of all time. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting that impression, um, and for reasons we'll probably go to a bit later on. So, before we get into that, how did you discover Brogan Holmes? At the time, um, I gosh, I you know it's weird. I remember it so distinctly. At the time, I was working. I was a, cons- um, a carpenter's apprentice, and we were doing some work in a doctor's office, some sheetrock nonsense in a, in a doctor's office and we always had the radio on and i heard the song in another land come on and i was like what is this you know and it really grabbed my ear and they said who it was this was back in the day in, in the states and radio when there was a little bit more freedom with radio stations to play new stuff it's a little bit more regimented today but a separate argument but i found out who it was went to my local record store, got the record, and dropped the needle on it, as it were. I mean, literally. And uh, if you're a music fan, I don't know if you've ever, or if you are a musician or ever fantasized about being a musician, I certainly did. And this would be what I would want my band to sound like. Funny you say, funny you say that. At the time of recording, Wednesday of this week, um, I'm involved in a Birmingham kind of record listening group. Okay. And um, the called off the record, and the theme of that that so I because like yeah you have one of the members host and bring an album to talk about for people, and then you'll sit down, you'll everyone sits in silence listening to the whole album for thirty minutes to an hour, and then they'll talk about it. It's, there's there's a lot of crossover with this podcast actually, and um yeah, and the theme that we we did the album I brought was albums that you wished you'd made. And when you hear an album and um you hear an album and you're like it ticks so many the phrase i use is box ticking where you've got so many things that you like about music and they tick so many boxes you're thinking but yeah you hear something and it's like crap this is probably w- if i had like any talent in music or in like <laughs> we like doing yeah. stuff this is the album that this is an album which is very close to what i think in my like i would think um and that's quite that's and the time with that's quite kind kind of like interesting because um because I've just been we've just been just talking about this um comes like theme uh, yeah. on on Wednesday with a uh, album stuff and the band and the, the band even kind of caught wind and sent a bunch of like copies of the vinyl oh, wow. <laughs> for me to give stuff yeah so um and it's yeah and that was the Teen Girl Scientist Monthly Hypertrophy album which um, long term listeners to the podcast will know that I actually spoke to Matt Roy Berger of the band for episode fifty so my episode fifty celebration was me being quite self indulgent and getting a member of the actual band to talk about an album that I've liked oh, so great. um yeah so I, that's 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 quite a nice coincidence so yeah, yeah I, I, I totally understand that kind of feeling where you think you, you hear something and you think crap this did i will this album into existence this just seems <laughs> to be this seems to be everything that in my head that if i had the opportunity to would do that and i think that's i think that's like a lovely kind of thing to find when you do that i mean man that's like my mind's kind of blown by the coincidence of the timing of this recording when you're saying that because generally um generally just earlier this week at the time of recording uh i was having a discussion with a group of about 10 11 people about the exact same kind of concept mm-hmm. yeah and i think when you have an album like that you just you, you connect with it and you're thinking like yeah and there's yeah. not many there's not even like quite a few of my favorite albums i've got a few albums there's only a few that like in an alternative world would be something that you're creating and stuff and, the, and you, you just develop a connection to it and like we're feeling to try and say more people should listen to this. A hundred percent correct. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. No, I can, I'm putting into that. So, and I'm assuming this was the first album of theirs you listened to then. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, Broken Homes, they're a band that I tried to look and I don't think I could find a Wikipedia article about them, which means I can't do my usual kind of sneak thing and just read stuff off the Wikipedia article. So, um, yeah. So, that's why I'm here. Yeah. So, hey, why don't you so for people so for people who aren't aware of um, who Broken Homes are slash were, um, are you okay to give us a kind of like a, a very short crash course into who the band were? 
Sure. They were, um, you know, a four piece rock and roll band from Los Angeles. Uh, they were Craig Ross on guitar, Jimmy Ashurst on bass. Mike Doman was the lead singer and Craig Aronson was the drummer. And those are all names that'll, that'll pop up again and again throughout this discussion, but they were part of, you know, arguably, you know, some folks might say the cow punk movement of the early to mid eighties, which was like, you know, uh, lone justice. It was like a hybrid of punk, what we might call alternative country today and rock and roll. Um, the blasters were another band that came out of that, that scene. Um, and they were, uh, broken homes played the usual spots. Uh, back then it was a different scene. You, you played locally and you built up a reputation and the A&R scouts would come. And that's what happened with these guys. They built an audience. They had a very, uh, by all accounts, a very exciting live show. Um, there's one story when the A&R guy, who's a guy named Michael Goldstone, saw them with the producer, Jeff Eirich, and Mike Doman would, you know, swing from the rafters, which would come into play about six or seven years later with Eddie Vedder, who used to, would do that stuff in his live performance. So um, interesting. And by all accounts, they were a very, very exciting and dynamic live band. I never got the chance to see them, but that is what led to them being signed to MCA Records by Michael Goldstone. Okay. So, uh, and where were they from? Do you know where those? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, three of the four, Craig... Ross, the guitar player, Jimmy Ashurst, the bass player, and Craig Aronson, the drummer, were all from California. And I want to say Los Angeles area, but certainly Southern California. Um, and Mike Doman was from Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And he came, he came out west to follow the rock and roll dream, as oh, people okay. do. Yeah. Okay, so... I'm, so, I'm going to assume, I'm going to, with that, I'm going to assume the California thing. I couldn't drive, I couldn't find a city of origin, which uh, messes up my uh, kind of behind the scenes spreadsheets where I've got, a, 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 I've, got I've got like a spreadsheet which counts um, whereabouts bands are from. So I know how many. So yeah, at the moment, the amount of US bands that I've covered is ridiculous. And then I think it's like between California and New York, which is like my, uh, the most like band, like, I would imagine band stuff. Yeah, um, and me being a massive spreadsheet geek, I'm like, if, with that, with that data missing, I'm like, but, um, <laughs> so how long did they end up last, lasting? I, I got impression that they, so I've, I've read somewhere they released three albums and then kind of ended after like about four years, three or four years. Is that um, their recording career lasted from '86 was the first record, and I think the last one. Wing and a Prayer was 90 or 91. So, you know, five or six years of recording career prior to that, I would, I would say the tenure of the band, maybe less than 10 years, definitely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> Do you know why they broke up? Or? I don't. And I would suspect, and it's pure speculation on my part, it was just uh, the band wasn't going anywhere. They probably got dropped by MCA Records. And, you know, and at that point, you know, uh, Craig Aronson, who was the original drummer, had left to pursue a career in artist and repertoire or A and R. Um, so I think the realization that despite their best efforts and exceptional talent, that they just couldn't crack through to a larger audience, I would guess, pure speculation, they just decided to throw in the towel. And I know for certain that both Craig and Jimmy are still friends. They they speak regularly and they're very tight. So it wasn't as near as I can tell. And there wasn't any animus involved in the breakup, at least certainly not between those two guys. Oh, okay. Um, so, and I know um, two of the members have sadly passed, passed away. They have. Um, which I think is the lead singer and... Uh, the drummer. Craig Aronson died of cancer yeah. <clears throat> in 2014. And Mike Doman, the lead singer, passed away in December of 2020. If I have that. I think I have that. Um, and I think one one of them was one of them wasn't an an A&R. Was it the one you mentioned uh, the drummer who became an A&R guy? Because um, mm -hmm. I remember reading an article, um, and there's quite a few kind of higher profile bands um, citing them as a reason that they got signed or got to say. And I'm pretty sure Jimmy Eat World was one of them. Yep, 
Um, Craig went on to have a wildly successful career in A&R. Um, he did sign Jimmy Eat World. Uh, he signed The Used, My Chemical Romance, Taking Back Sunday, At the Drive-In. And Jimmy, as you mentioned, Jimmy Eat World. He, I don't want to say single-handedly, but I mean, he certainly had a considerable impact on the sound of rock and roll, really, from the late 90s through the mid to late aughts. Um, there's a great book by Dan Ozzy called Sellout. And if you read the book or listen to it on the audiobook, you hear his name pop up almost chapter after chapter. Craig Aronson is involved in this. Even if he didn't sign the band, he's at the label and helped work the band. He was, by all accounts, extremely passionate and excited about music, about rock music. And that's one of the things that I think made him such a great A&R guy. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, we podcast has had episodes on My Chemical Romance and Jimmy World um, in the past. I think Jimmy World was like the seventh episode, seventh or eighth episode we ever did. Um, and then My Chemical Romance at some point last year. Um, yeah, I think, um, like, yeah, so I think the kind of legacy of what he's done for, I think perhaps, if less than not, perhaps more towards the emo scene at least. Yeah. There yeah. seems to be a lot on towards e like the emo scene where, um, for sure. I don't know where he's, where, it, there's a viewpoint in which might be he's to blame, but <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, but yeah, but we, I think there's some of the names that you've read. Some of them are very kind of formative uh -huh. lynch pin, linchpins in like certain sure. scenes. I mean, My Chemical Romance probably started a whole generation of kind of emo goth rock. Yeah, um, of people wanting to be Gerard Way, and they came, yeah. they they felt so fresh and like, yeah, so um. Which and I don't yeah. want to I don't want to I don't want to pimp Dan's book, but that particular chapter on My Chemical Romance in his book was I had no idea. I, I they they seemed they worked really hard, and I I don't think I would know a My Chemical song if I heard it. But I was like really impressed with their work ethic and their dedication to their fans. Very impressive. My Chemical Romance very different in terms of it's probably about five percent of this album in My Chemical Romance stuff, but. You yeah, if you ever do decide to check it, check out the out, you can probably tell from just by listening that this is this is a band that like feel like they were creating something new for oh. a certain generation of people. Even if even if you don't like it, you can't deny that the amount of stuff that they've done. So something that he saw in them hmm. like changed that. So um, yeah, I mean, um, I just wanted to bring that up because I think the the A and R side of perhaps the music industry at least. Um, very important and um yeah i think that uh him being responsible for quite a few bands being picked up i think it just needed to be mentioned anyway in terms of uh my kind of knowledge of broken homes i had no idea who they were mm -hmm. when you mentioned them um which was good because i quite i quite like the what i quite like that kind of episodes where it's like that because then like oh it's someone's kind of like not dirty secret but like someone's picked something that they kind of have a lot of passion for mm -hmm. um and the type of vibe I can get behind, um, and it'd be interesting. To it'd be interesting to kind of research into them. So when I started googling them, I found uh, other bands with the same name. <laughs> other bands with the same name. Um, I think there's a British band um, from the late seventies, early eighties called Broken Home, which was um, gets picked up by Rate Your Music, and then there's an album called Broken Homes by a group called Broken Homes that was released last year in a band from London. Um, oh. Yeah, so I found that on Bandcamp. Um, okay. But yeah, but um, other than that, I had no real idea of who they are. And interestingly enough, when I started trying to narrow down the Google searches, things that kept popping up were things written by people online. Um, a guy called Keith. Um, like, <laughs> yeah, on the first page, there was an, a medium.com article um, that I read, which I was like, oh, okay, that name sounds familiar. And then looked at the profile picture and it was the same profile picture you used for me for the episode artwork. Yep. So you've, so you've, um, in the past used the kind of, this album to kind of preach the ver preach how good this was. And you said it was also the Genesis for your own podcast. It was. So, so what is, so what was it about this album that made you want to kind of share it as much as you can? And why did you, how did it start abandoned albums? Well, I want to go back to the A&R aspect of this really quickly because the guy who did sign Broken Homes to MCA is a guy named Michael Goldstone. Mm -hmm. 
aka Goldie. Now he was the A and R guy. One of his, <clears throat> pardon me, one of his first signings was Broken Homes to MCA. Now, unless you're a complete nerd, you won't know the name Michael Goldstone. But this is a guy who signed Broken Homes, and then he would go on to sign a band called Mother Love Bone. And when Andy Wood died, uh, the lead singer of Mother Love Bone, the remaining members became Pearl Jam. And he signed Pearl Jam to Epic Records. Uh, he signed Rage Against the Machine. He signed Buck Cherry. He signed Shudder to Think, um, Against Me, Tegan and Sarah. So this is another so, guy. No, so not, not really. So no one really that important then, I guess. No, not at all. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and he did work with Craig Harrison as well. I think they, I don't know if they worked in tandem, but they did work together at a lot of the same labels. So this is a guy who clearly had good insight, good, good ears, they'll say, you know, and um, he signed Broken Homes. So the ingredients were there. Um, and I just, as long as I've known this record, I've tried to turn it on to people. I just think it's, I just think it's a really good, good fucking record that is overlooked. And like I said, all the ingredients were there. You know, the, 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 the bad thing, MCA Records wasn't really a good rock and roll label. They just, they had Tom Petty. That was their rock act. That was it, really. A good one to have, don't get me wrong, but they really weren't known for rock and roll. But um, yeah, I just, over the years, I just keep championing this album. I just think it's that good. And it's, 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 it's the plight of the debut album, right? Um, I don't think Broken Homes were ever as good as they are on that first record. The next two albums suffer for different reasons I can get into, but that first record, I really think, captures the essence of who they were as individuals and as a band. And, you know, arguably, it could be said that this debut record laid the blueprint out for, you know, the Black Crows and some of that rock resurgence that took place you know, the late, the later 80s, the early 90s, not necessarily grunge, but some of that harder rock, some of that almost pseudo classic rock. This, it could be argued, laid the blueprint for that. Why did you set up the podcast? Was it just so you could speak about this album on record? Or? <laughs> no, <laughs> I've always had this idea kicking around. It's like, wow. And it's all, it was all centered around this record. I'm like, why didn't this album get the attention? And I wrote an article on Medium. And then I was contacted by somebody, a gentleman named Don Harvey. And he's like, hey, I read your article. I really liked it. I'm the guy who played drums on that record. And I was like, no, you're not. Greg Aronson, he played drums. Uh, so I'm reading it, and I'm a little bit skeptical. And I pull out my record, and I look, and sure enough, buried in the impossible to read uh, liner notes is Don Harvey. So I replied. I said, hey, thanks. You know, appreciate it. I was like, what do you mean you, you were the... You were the drummer. And he replied and told me that he was the producer, Jeff Irick, wasn't getting the sound from Craig that he wanted or thought the songs deserved. Deserve, so he called up Don Harvey. And Don Harvey came down and, and did the drums for, for the record. And, and I said, wow, would you be interested in, in telling your story to me and for a podcast? And he's like, yeah, I'd love to. I was like, oh, well, now I actually have to fucking do this. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a sitcom. It sounds like kind of like a sitcom plot where, like, where someone yeah. says, oh, yeah, we'll do this. And then, like, you know, like, there's where someone says, oh, yeah, and they have to kind of, I don't know, fake a restaurant for something or yep. just something. They're like, crap, I need to, I need to create a podcast just to, so I can have this conversation. It, I was like, oh, oh okay. Um, <clears throat> so I started nosing around, and that's when I found out that I was like, all right, well, I've, poked around on Facebook and followed Mike Doman on Facebook. And I went back and I found out that he passed away. This would have been a year ago now, a little over a year ago. And I'm like, oh, Mike passed away. So that sucks. I know Craig is already dead. So as I set a date with Don to record, and about a week before, he said, are you going to contact Craig and Jimmy, the two surviving members of the band? And I was like, yeah, sure, of course I am. I have no plans to contact these guys. These guys are musicians, busy musicians, rock stars. I mean, 
fuck that. And I followed him on social media. Jimmy and I had a brief exchange about two years before on Twitter. One of the things I've always wanted to do is re-release this record because it is long out of print. And I had contacted Jimmy around, I'm trying to remember when the Universal Fire was, shortly after the Universal Fire. There's a big fire at Universal that burned up far too many master copies of, of benchmark albums, you know, um, going back decades, a horrible loss. But um, so I knew enough to know that in order to print a new vinyl, you needed to draw it from the master. I knew that. So I reached out to Jimmy via Twitter. I was like, hey, Jimmy, you don't know me, blah, 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 blah. Did this broken homes, did the masters burn up in the fire? He goes, yeah, they did. And we, a little back and forth. But in any event, fast forward, Don's like, are you going to contact Craig and Jimmy? Oh, yeah, of course I am. Interesting. I followed them both on Instagram. And I sent Craig a, a DM. He got back to me within five minutes. He's like, yeah, I'd love to talk about that record. I'm like, well, all right. Uh, Jimmy did not get back to me um, right away. And so I replied to Don. I'm like, yeah, Craig's going to join us. And then... We were recording on a Sunday that Friday. I was like, you know what? Let me look up Jeff Eyrick, the producer, and see what he's doing. And I look him up and I sent him an email. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm talking about this Broken Homes record, you know, for this new podcast. Would you be wanting, would you be willing to come on and talk about it? He got back to me right away. He's like, yeah, I'd love to. He goes, I'm on vacation in Greece. So there's a time difference. Just let me know what time and how to dial in. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally have most of the creative team behind this record that I absolutely love coming on to talk to myself and Rob Janicki about it. And uh, it was terribly exciting, you know, to get these guys all on one line and, and, and chat about it. So it was really Don Harvey who, who drove me to do it. I've always had the idea, but I probably never had the uh, intestinal fortitude to do it until I asked, he said, yeah. And then it came together rather quickly and rather easily. And then, and then after, after that, that was like your first episode. Yeah. So you didn't then that just like, and then I'm assuming it was like, oh, that was a lot of fun. So what other albums can I talk about? <laughs> exactly. And, it, yeah. and what was interesting when we, when we all got together, you know, Jeff Eyrick, the producer had not spoken to Craig Ross since the recording of the record. He had, he had spoken with Don since then, but, and Don certainly hadn't spoken with Craig or Jeff, you know, it's just been, it was sort of like a reunion of sorts. And then at the end of it, I said, Hey, Craig, you know, I reached out to Jimmy. Um, if you want to give him my contact information, I'd love to still get his perspective and interview him as well. And Craig said, yeah, I'll do that. And the next day I got an email from Jimmy. He's like, yeah, man, sorry, I couldn't make it, but I'd love to talk to you about the record. So Rob and I interviewed Jimmy later that week. So it all came together. I had, for that initial podcast, I had the surviving creative team behind one of my favorite albums of all time. Wow. That's... And, then, and then from there, yeah. The, and... <clears throat> you peaked too early. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the, some of the interview skills I have now that I, I had back then. Back that first episode, I was a bit of a fanboy. I was a bit too excited to talk to these guys, but you know, and I did as, as, as we were leading up, I'm like, Oh God, now I got to think of other albums, you know? But, and so I did. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's this broken homes record. You know, we mentioned Craig, what he went on to do. Um, Don Harvey is a very seasoned session drummer at the time. He was drumming with Charlie Sexton. And then he moved back to Austin and let's see. And then Michael Goldstone, the guy who signed them, did his thing. Craig Ross, who after the, after Broken Homes broke up, would go on to play with Lenny Kravitz and still plays with Lenny to this day. In addition to writing, co-writing a couple, more than one of Lenny's hits with him. Um, Jimmy went on to play with Izzy Stradlin and the Juju Hounds, Buck Cherry. Stint a brief live tour with the cult. Uh, he's, an in-demand bass player. So everything about this band should have, should have, should have been successful, it seems. But 
the music was there, the talent was there. Mm. They had a big label behind them at the time. MCA was run by Irving Azoff. Um, uh, it still remained flowing all these years on. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I think me. That, that's I think the, the story. The story of how you interviewed them and stuff, and how you just generate the podcast. I think that's an amazing story. Um, I guess I kind of like a fresh origin story. I don't, I don't think I've had anything like that as part of, part of the origin story of someone's. Well, well, it's not really an origin story. It's just. It's just a further cementing a kind of personal relationship with the music and the album stuff. And everyone has those kind of like stories and stuff and why they keep falling and growing connections to the band and stuff. And yeah. again, yeah, I think heading back to when I recorded episode 50, there's just something kind of like quite exciting when you're talking to someone about something they created. And um, even though that is pretty much what this podcast wasn't going to be, but um, <laughs> um, it's about people's relationship to it. Um, but yeah. no, episode 50 was my, it was, yeah, it was my kind of self-indulgent. I, I picked it, but, uh, but yeah, but uh, the, um, but I think having that ability to kind of talk about something that you like and having the people involved in it. Yeah. There's just, this is just like a buzz, as you said, like you, you just kind of fanboying out a bit and, but you, you can't, you can't have that. I mean, you, I mean, but that was like an album that you listened to for what? 30 odd yes. years beforehand um that was like something that you kind of passion like for passionately for all mm -hmm. that time and like 30 years of like listening to it kind of paid off with an opportunity to kind of um sure. talk about it with the people that made it and sure. yeah that yeah that again possibly you've peaked too early with you <laughs> no <laughs> with podcast, stop saying but... that <laughs> <laughs> but no but no i think or at least it's a good starting off point anyway <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah, no, that nothing. That that's a really lovely story and a kind of like nice arc of the kind of like you love for the album and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But the album itself, um, we, I mean, we've, I mean, we've talked for about half an hour about kind of your relationship with it and the band itself. Um, but let's actually talk about the album then. Let's talk to uh -huh. about things about why and what it does and stuff. And I think the first thing that I noticed was when I first started listening to it, was it was a lot more kind of jangle, um, uh -huh. to use a phrase, like kind of jangle pop, jangle rock. Sure. Um, from, and I, I, I did look at the time as well. Um, are you aware of the, C, the, the C86 uh, cassette from Enemy? No. So Enemy, um, around May 1986, they released a compilation tape called the C86, which was like a reference to the like the C60, C9, C90 kind of cassettes. And so it initially was seen as kind of like, like how emo or tweeny, well, it's linked to tweet. You know, sometimes how some like labels are meant to be kind of like, like insulting, like mm -hmm. people would use emo as a slur against music. Oh, that's so emo. Or twee, even though I don't think twee at all. Uh, see, the C86 became kind of like, um, kind of pejorative term for certain kind of pieces of music, but it's it was seen as kind of like a kind of key moment for independent music in the UK. And so, for example, Primal Scream, uh, okay, the uh, the Wedding Present, uh, Half Man Half Biscuit, Servants, uh, the Pastels, uh, Stop Mighty Mighty, Four Pounds, Mighty Lemon Drops. So basically, they've got kind of like a British kind of indie sound which i think just about predates the smiths um as a kind of like jangly kind of rock but more kind of soft indie rock but have that kind of nice jangly almost twee sound to them okay. um yeah the 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 c86 is kind of a label for like a being a pivotal move moment for that kind of mo music movement and mm -hmm. um i initially thought listen to this that this band was english because of how similar it was, how similar it kind of some of the songs are very similar to the sound of that. But then I think realizing they're American, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But there's a lot of kind of crossover, like a bit of that kind of music, which would lead towards more of an indie pop sound and reminds me a lot of the stuff that I listened to in the late noughties. Um, so it feels like there's a kind of lineage of that. But then what I then found is that that's only like a small amount of what the album does because then the album kind of then starts veering in completely different sounds of rock to the point that I think what I quite 
I found this to be a very kind of interesting exploration of what, of stretching the genre of rock and all the different kind of sounds you can make with it. Um, so that initial jangle stuff was like, oh, it's really nice. But then the next, then like two episodes, then in two time, you've got Chuck Berry. You've got yeah. Chuck Berry style guitars mm-hmm. mixing, like somehow conflicting and fighting with different genres together. Yeah. Um, and I found that very, very interesting <laughs> to do. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Craig is a guitar player. Um, you know, Mike Doman is written is is credited as the songwriter for for the majority of these songs. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to go down that path. But Craig and Jimmy were were fucking kids. They were probably 17, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, Mike was a little bit older. I don't know how old how much older he was, but uh, these are kids, and I think that's not something to lose sight of. You know. As as good as the music is, it's like the kids essentially. Yeah, but I think I think it's like kids who kind of grew up with a varied like record collection or very musical upbringing because there's quite a lot of different stuff in this. Mm-hmm. Like, and I, the kind of example I can from my personal his, music history that I can liken to is that there are elements. If not not sounding like it, because uh, they end up they sound a lot more grunge grungy than this album would do um the band wolf alice i don't know if you're aware of wolf alice i know the name i don't yeah i know the name wolf alice wolf alice a kind of british band who they've had three albums now and each album very much rock and has that kind of grungy rock to them but they're constantly evolving their sound and they'll always kind of experiment and see what they can do with rock music to the point where like they'll do these kind of like weird interesting things like and just try and do different sounds and this has that kind of same thing where they'll go like, okay what like they'll like they'll write rock music and then they'll have like a spider diagram with all the different aspects or different mm. subgenres and then try think okay let's have this song be a bit more of that rock music and this one being more rock and roll this one being more kind of jangle rock this one being more grunge this seems to feel like it wants to kind of explore Okay, we know we know we're not just going to be a jangle pop band. We don't want to be a rock and roll band. We want to have our kind of blues rock. We want our kind of yeah. standard rock. We want our stadium yeah. rock, and all in the same album. Yeah. And I quite like that. There's, I found an interview actually. Um, Devora Ostroff, who was a um kind of like fanzine writer, has a blog with um an interview for, with uh Jimmy Ashurst on there from oh. um. 1989. Okay. It opens up with Asher saying, like, the band has been misunderstood over the years. Jimmy Asher's the basis for Broken Homes, isn't complaining about the lack of recognition this group has received so much as he's trying to understand why. And this is this is the quote. This is the quote that he said. <clears throat> it seems like it's been difficult for business people, record company people, and agency people to figure out what kind of band we are. We're just a rock and roll band. It's not that difficult to figure out, but you can't sit them down and explain it. You feel like an idiot. You just kind of go, fuck, what are you, stupid? But that doesn't help your situation. And until they figure it out, you're fucked. I don't mean to sound bitter or cynical, but I am. <laughs> it goes on to say, and the, the article then, the interview then goes on to explain that they've just completed tours supporting Georgia Satellites and Joan Jett. Yeah, and I think at the time, um, there was just about to record a cover of Creedence Clearwater Revival's Born on the Bayou for an upcoming Oliver Stone movie, as well as preparing their material for the third album. But that quote, I think it's like, I find that quite interesting after listening to it, because it's not, I don't think it's a case of them trying to find an identity. I think, I think they're perhaps slightly ahead of their time in that they don't want to narrow it down. And like there are there are out there are bands nowadays, like one day bands that are kind of constantly flexing and changing and stuff. So, um um I mean I only like the one album of theirs, but Twenty One Pilots Twenty One Pilots had a kind of almost they had their album vessels which I like is basically the killers if the killers rapped. Um <laughs> and then their next album um is basically a dubstep album. Oh, wow. somehow still feels like the same band. Um, yeah, so you've got that kind of like band, like band's not afraid to keep trying anything out. And this is the band that's doing it <laughs> on one album. So I yeah. find that quite interesting. And that was written, that, that was from 1989. 
Mm-hmm. That was from Race the Iron. So it's quite interesting that um, it's. I don't know if the band had. I don't think the band had, or at least Ashurst, um, he wasn't saying the. He wasn't saying. I don't know if you understood what I was trying to say in terms of that they're deliberately being kind of spread out. I think it's more a case that it's probably more frustration about that they're trying to pigeonhole them into something when they should just be kind of left as an open kind of, uh, just like a, a, an exploration rock band, if that makes sense. It does. And that's one of the things that I think that's so, um, I'm loath to use the word important. So I'll, I'll substitute the word special about that first record is that, as I mentioned, they, they were, I don't think they were ever this good again. And this is the sound of Broken Homes. And it is a straight up rock and roll record. It's not anything fancy. It's just straight up good old fashioned rock and roll. And at the time in the mid eighties, you know, there were, who was popular? George Michael, a lot of pop music was popular, not slagging pop music. It just rock and roll was at the time being marginalized to some extent. It certainly for newer bands. If you were an established rock act, you would get your airplay, you would get your, your video play, you would get all that. But an, an up and coming rock band kind of got pushed aside. And I think that is what happened with Broken Homes, certainly on that first record, you know. And I think it's interesting to point out that nowadays, if a band releases a record, a debut record, and it tanks, that's it, they're done. The label's not going to keep them around. MCA kept them around for another two albums. And they really sunk their teeth into them. And, you know, the second album was produced by uh, Tony Berg, who's a big producer. The third record was produced by Andy Johns. So they put some muscle behind it. But, and I don't want to slag the other two albums. I just don't think they're as strong as that first one. And, um, And to Jimmy's point, I don't think record labels at the time knew what to do with a rock and roll band. And it would take, not to, not to, not to blow smoke up anybody, anybody's ass, but it would take Michael Goldstone and some of the bands that he signed to get that needle to turn back to rock and roll. And then that would eventually become grunge. So to your point, Broken Homes were a little bit ahead of their time. I find that quite, quite interesting in how much you kind of like signaled some of the kind of, we'll probably talk about it a bit more when we get to some of the more songs specifically. But I just found that quite an interesting um, mix of stuff. Uh, so, and there is, there is, you know, for a band to, you know, so much has to fire at the same time in order for a band to hit. You know, the marketing team has to get behind it. Um, the 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 PR team, you know, everyone has to sort of get behind it. If if I'm an advocate for your band, right? And I've got everyone aligned with me and then I get a job over at Geffen Records. I'm going to leave. Well, now nobody's going to want to support the projects that I supported. So then that band gets, can fall by the wayside. So a lot of things have to fire at the same time. And of course, there are stories where bands, you know, grow and become successful organically. But by and large, when you're in the machine, Things have to fire at the same time, and that could have been one of the reasons why the record didn't. didn't yeah, work. I think. And what's interesting is that the uh, the the very last kind of quote from Jimmy from mm-hmm. this the, the, the last paragraph. Um, of course, no side project could pull Jimmy away from his commitments to the Broken Homes because he just talks about him playing for um, a band called Smack. To, like, uh, so, they was looking for a permanent bassist, so he kind of played for a few uh, a few gigs with them, and he said, "Yeah." Earlier, he goes. This is not relevant to the one I'm about to say, but I really like playing with Smack. I was getting really lazy with the homes. Not only is our music more laid back, but we've just been doing it for so long that the rehearsals are just a joke. Playing with Smack woke me up. It was good for me to have to learn three albums worth of material in a week. <laughs> but then um, the final paragraph goes, Of course, no side project could pull Jimmy away from his commitment to the broken homes. And while he wishes his band was better known, he's taken a commendable stand on the subject of selling out. We're sticking to our guns, he firmly states. We're not going to change anything for the quick book. That could have been easily done, and it hasn't. People will realise that our music is good, whether they realise it now or five years from now, we will be recognised at some point in time. That's compensation enough for me. And then the interview ends. 
Mm. So, uh, yeah. So Jimmy, think... Jimmy's one of the best interviews. He's never <laughs> short on. He's very quotable. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's quite, but yeah, that's quite almost poignant line to, name, to end on. Like 30 years, what, 32 years after the interviews them. But like, yeah, um, people will realize their music is good and, and you'll have podcasters trying to tell people, he's right. A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I, it's, yeah, it, it's a great rock and roll record. Yeah. Hands down. So, so the album has eight tracks. Um, it does. Yeah, depending on uh, how much time we've got, we won't be able to go through sing every one of them. And um, which one, so which ones stand out to you that you want to talk about? Well, I think the first song I heard was In Another Land. Um, there was just, the lyrics on this record are not, it's not Shakespeare, it's not Tolstoy, it's just good old-fashioned rock and roll. And the word play is what really drew me in. I'm a lyric person, so the word play. So, for example, the, the opening line of In Another Land is, you've got a girl up north, a girl down south, what about the girl in your own house? I'm like, as an 18-year-old, that just kind of blew my mind, and it sort of captured the essence of what it must be to be a rock star. You know, you've got a girl up here. When you go up here to tell you got to go to, you know. And um, the next song is a song called An L.A. Rain. And there's a clever twist of a lyric there. The line is, <clears throat> she's 31 with ID for 24 or 25. And it, it twists. It just turns the table a little bit on that, 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 that narrative of, of worshiping the younger woman. You know, here's an older woman that the lead singer is with. Um, those two songs really grab me. And that's the one-two punch of the record. That's the first and second song. Um, uh, Painless Saturday is a good song. Uh, out, in the, out, out in the Fields is, is a good song. These are great songs. The imagery of the songs is not, you know, it's not Dylan-esque. It doesn't paint these, you know, portraits that, that will fill up your brain, but they tell a story. You know, Out in the Fields tells a story. Uh, Painless Saturday. You know, I'll be, wearing, uh, I'll be wearing blue. On the day you're wearing white, I'll be wearing blue. Which is, you know, not revolutionary, but done correctly, it's powerful. Um, so that's what, that's what drew me into a lot of these songs. If I had to single out one song in particular, it would be Steel Town, Blues Town. It is just an all balls out rocker um, about what it's like. Well, you're in Birmingham, so you're probably familiar with at least my understanding of Birmingham, an industrial type environment, right? And that's with Mike Doman being from Pittsburgh. That's sort of the imagery we get in Steel Town, Blues Town is that Pittsburgh imagery. And in the early to mid 80s, you know, the U.S. steel market was, was going through a tremendous downturn. So people were losing their jobs in steel towns and it tells that story, but it doesn't overtell it, you know, and it's just guttural rock and roll with the jangly guitar, you know, um, that would be the one song. And interestingly, that's the only video that I could find for the record is steel town, blues town. But, uh, yeah, I, I just, and yes, it's all over now is the same sort of thing. It closes out the record, which is appropriate, right? Yes, it's all over now, which is another jangly sort of barn burner. And uh, But if I had to pick one song, it's definitely Steel Town, Blues Town. It's just incredible. So, yes, yeah, so and if you're talking about Steel Town, Blues Town in a bit more in detail, and then perhaps back up to talk about a few of the other ones in detail, Steel Town, Blues Town for me is the kind of almost, it's not Heartland Rock, but it has a lot of, Reminded me a lot of Springsteen, and mm -hmm. that's like, uh, like, okay, yeah. So, what, what haven't we done yet? He goes, he goes, what haven't we done yet? And he goes, well, I've just been listening to Dark Sunday of the Town, um. So, why don't we do a bit of that and some of that storytelling stuff? And again, um, Springsteen or oh, pretty much Heartland Rock is the salt of the earth kind of the to throw Britisham here working class, um, kind of representation. Yeah, yeah. um, and everything and. Again, it's it's kind of rock and roll with the kind of like jangliness in it, but there's a real kind of heartland 
soul to it. And I don't know, I don't know how far Pittsburgh is from the kind of heart of the rock here area. It's right there. It's it's right on the border of Ohio. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, so that the kind, so they kind of, so it's not far from the musicians. So I'm assuming that um, who was it that was born in Pittsburgh? Was it Mike? Mike Dome. Mike Dome. So yeah, so I'm assuming that he's had. So I'm assuming he had grew up with that a kind of that rock kind of area of rock into it. So this is so it has that kind of feel to it, and one of many examples of incorporating those sounds into another kind of version of rock. I want to I want to zero in on that for one second because you yeah, mentioned yeah. the Heartland Rock and I agree with you a hundred percent. And what's interesting about the two follow up records is I think there was I mentioned earlier that I think this record, the debut record, captures the essence of the band and the sound of the band. The following two records, I think, is a real earnest attempt at making heartland rock and roll Mm. you know and and the problem i found with those records is that they're good and they're good at that heartland sound that we're talking about it's just that they lost some of the individuality that i think was on the debut record and in fairness there were other artists at the time who were doing that sound better you know john mellencamp bodine's um people like that were just the records aren't bad it's just there were other folks doing it better and that's what makes this debut record so good Mm -hmm. it's because there isn't sort of any manipulation it's them without any sort of outside influence essentially but i i think hitting on that heartland rock sound is, is absolutely correct yeah um yeah and i think again i think that the whole still ten blues ten. I I kind of feel that's like almost not a pun, but a kind of reference to that kind of the subject matter of the Heartland Rock thing mm-hmm. as well. So yeah, which feels almost not like a kind of not poking fun, but almost a parody name of Seals Town Blues Town, unless it is an actual name of a town or um, no. But I think you know Steel Town is something. People would, I mean, I certainly, I grew up in Ohio, so I remember steel towns, Youngstown, Pittsburgh. Uh, they were steel towns. I think allegory there is a steel mm-hmm. town and blues, as steel is, as steel in America was having its downturn, it becomes blues. It's no longer rock and roll. I mean, I, we could go down that rabbit hole as well. I don't necessarily, from understanding, I don't think it was really so tongue in cheek. I think it was really sort of an homage. And, to what was happening. I don't have the lyrics up in front of me, but it does tell the story of a steel worker, you know? If we move on slightly to um, another song to talk about, what song do you perhaps want to talk about in a bit more detail next? 30,000 Feet is an interesting song. Um, you know, it tells the story of uh, somebody flying back seemingly to their hometown. And of course, this is 1986, so it, it predates 9-11 when flying was an entirely different experience in the 80s. You had smoking sections on a, on a plane. Um, and he tells the story about what it's like flying, you know, 500 miles an hour at 30,000 feet above the ground. You know, it's a, long, it's a long way home and a longer way down. And it's sort of that clever, again, not groundbreaking wordplay, but just clever enough to capture. And um, he tells the story of sitting next to somebody. And it's, I think, that's what the band does throughout the record. It's tough to single out one particular song because each one tells a little vignette of of a you know story. And um, yes, it's all over now. Just another great jangly guitar about the end of a relationship. Who can't identify with that? You know. So it, it's tough. The one song is Steel Town Blues Town. I think the rest of the songs, each in their own way stand up as vignettes and great stories um, and they're like to your point there is a bunch of different genres represented and certainly influenced in each of those songs and they do it really well yeah i think there's um and this one this one's that this one i think is a lot more of a kind of rock and roll like a more straightforward rock and roll song um 
for sure. Yeah, so it's uh, it's le- it's less of the kind, it's less of the hybrid kind of cocktail mixing of rock, as I'll, yeah. I'll refer to it as. The songs that the songs that didn't necessarily nail it for me, but I still think are good are are the ballads, and Craig is attributed for. I'll be wearing blue. I think he co-wrote that with Mike. He's attributed as co-writer. Um, they're good songs. Uh, the ballads, they almost seemed as though they were perfunctory to some extent. Like you gotta have, we gotta have some barn burners. We gotta have a couple of ballads. You know, it seemed to be the recipe, and they seemed to fit that bill. But for me, it was the rock songs that did it. Yeah, the um. The song 30,000 Feet, one of the weirdest kind of things that showed up when Googling this band was a Miami Vice Wikipedia. Mm. Uh, so, you know, hey, like almost everything's got Wikipedia articles now. Uh, there's a season three episode of Miami Vice where this song appears. <laughs> yeah, which apparently appears in the opening uh, in an episode of Miami Vice called By Hooker By Crook. What's interesting about there, they did land some songs on soundtracks. Okay. They did. Interestingly, if you look up those soundtracks now, the Broken Home songs are not on there. In fact, there is a there's a, a song that was in Beverly Hills Cop 2, 2 or 3, I don't remember. Or, no, I'm sorry, it was another 48 Hours. And I was contacted by a, a guy in Italy who's also a Broken Homes fan who's been looking for that soundtrack to Another 48 Hours, which does exist, but what does not exist is the Broken Homes song that's in the movie is not on the soundtrack. And a couple of the other soundtracks that they've been on, for whatever reason, the Broken Homes song is not on the soundtrack. Yeah. And, and nobody seems to know why. It's a great that mystery. very interesting. That is very, very interesting. It is. What's the story there? I I don't know. So I think if you look up that Miami Vice soundtrack, you know, and there was at least one, I don't think you'd find a Broken Homes song. I wonder if it's it's deserved. I I don't know the final details. It might just be something to do with the record label and record labels and stuff like that. So they probably just didn't want to put them on there. But who knows? Again, decision, create decisions and stuff. Um, If we go back to LA Rain for a second. Sure. That was the song that kind of cemented to me, the idea that this album was going to like play around with different genres because it sounds like two different songs are fighting each other. Uh, so you'll have... Interesting. Yeah, so like the verses, the verses sound pretty much like um, like Chuck Berry or Martin McFly playing Johnny B. Good. So you have the kind of like almost 1950s rock and roll guitar that echoes through the verses. And then suddenly the choruses kick in, that guitar vanishes, and you've got and you've got kind of light jangle indie pop choruses. And then suddenly when the verses come back in, that that like Memphis guitar kind of like starts coming in. Because I, 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 I miss I misinterpreted it as surfer rock at first, but then when I was listening to it, I'm like, hang on, no, this is like this is like Chuck Berry and Considering it was like 1986, this is like not that far from this is your cousin, Marvin Berry. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's, yeah, it, it has that kind of, that it's that kind of guitar sound, which then kind of then goes and then this, then like another guitar takes out a completely different set of audio pedals oppressed. And then, yeah, you wouldn't think it's the same song. Um or at least the same guitarist. They just seem to like fight each other, and I, I, I think that's very interesting kind of sound. And for someone, for someone, and as someone who doesn't really notice, who keeps forgetting to listen to music, it, listen to the music, or doesn't re- has not really picked up, doesn't really pick up on these things. I found it very interesting that it was very easily to spot, and I always found it a very kind of interesting idea that you've got this kind of rock and roll song, and this jangle rock song, kind of playing one after the other. What's the what's the the key ingredient of any drama or anything, anything good? Tension, right? Yeah. And there's that tension playing in that song. Yeah, tension. Yeah, again, tension also um, appearing in Painless Saturday sounds very much like um, stuff I'll be listening. I was listening to in the mid to late noughties. Um, it reminds me so much of a band called uh, Pains of Being Pure at Heart. Mm-hmm. 
I think, yeah, well, they've got a song called Come Saturday. That's probably a big component of it. Um, so they've got a song called with the word Saturday in this. But yeah, I just kind of like, I kind of like the the vocal performance um, on it and the kind of like slow kind of build up. Like the, te- again, you said tension building up. And, and then I think about the one minute 50 mark, that's when the song kind of, the music of the song kicks in properly. Mm. And yeah, there's just, I, I can, there's a lot of, it sounds so much like um, something that will probably have been played at a festival I used to go to, which doesn't, sadly doesn't exist anymore. It didn't survive COVID called Indie Tracks, which have kind of like a jangle pop okay. kind of like bands play. So some of the bands that I mentioned in that C86 stuff will probably play there. Um, I've seen the wedding, the wedding present who was on that kind of compilation play there and stuff, but that sounds so much like it would be played on a, like they would do like headline that stage and like that song playing out to a bunch of people who are kind of like who love that kind of stuff um so yeah that so playing a saturday ticked so many boxes for me it was i really enjoyed that song that's great um you are not alone rob loved that song loves that song and it wasn't i mean i like it i think it's a great song mm. but i'm i'm a i'm a rock and roll guy that's that's my that's what i uh, love so you so you like go towards the more uh rock and roll style stuff yeah yeah i mean so yeah so that's like several instances of the song songs that are a couple of the couple of examples of the songs on the record in terms of the reception of the album i i couldn't really find much in terms of it being reviewed or people no. reviewing it online again like the only the only people the only like positive stuff that i could find on there is <laughs> written by you <laughs> um so i'm assuming do you do you know if of any like other kind of reception from it? Do you... I don't. I, I don't. At the time it came out, I was a diligent reader of Rolling Stone and Spin Magazine. I don't recall reading anything in those magazines. Um, I think there is a note on allmusic.com that might detail some of the, not even detail, just sort of talk about some of the things that I've mentioned. Um, no, I don't know the reception of the record. I, I think the fact that in this day and age that nothing exists is a pretty good indication of what the reception was. And his performance as well. So I'm assuming he didn't, I don't know how much, no. No, I don't even think it cracked. I don't think it cracked the Billboard 200. You've already, so you've, uh, the question I usually ask, but you've already mentioned, you've already answered this earlier about, did you ever see them live? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Have you ever seen any footage of them performing live? Or? I have not. No, I don't. Only the only thing I know of them performing live is the uh, Steel Town Blues Town video, and that's not a, that's a video, right? So you've not that been able a, to find any live footage from them at all. I no. haven't. I, 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 it's it's just a great mystery, <laughs> and it, yeah. and one would one might even argue it's a futile endeavor you know, to, to try to champion this band. And I just, it's, it's not stopping me. I'm not yeah. stopping. So, um, and again, you've, you've, you've briefly mentioned them before, but um, the other albums in the Broken Homes discography. So if people listen to this album like it and want to venture next, where would you recommend they go to next? I think it's a straight bet to go through chronologically. There's only three prayer. What's the second one, Paul? Um, I Straight through time. Straight line through time is the second one, and then Wing and a Prayer is the third one. Straight line through time, produced by Tony Berg, who would go on to produce. He worked with Paul Westerberg, a bunch of other artists, and then the great Andy Johns produced the third one, Wing and a Prayer. I think if people dig this one, just go straight through. There's no harm in starting. I, I, that would be my suggestion because that was my entry point. Right, I started with the debut record, went to the second one, went to the third one. So, but there's no shame in trying any of them, you know? Mm, okay, yeah. So, okay, if you're listening, just carry on second or third. Um, so, we're gearing up to the end of our uh, conversation, Keith. So, And we're here for the song for the Spotify playlist. So, if anyone's not listened to us before, what this is, I'm going to ask Keith to pick one song from this album to be immortalised forever on the Spotify Hall of Fame playlist. I can't veto it, so whatever Keith says goes. So he's got a very tough decision to pick one song from this album 
to appear from that. So, Keith, which song are you going to nominate to go on to playlist? Now, on the one hand, I could go with my default, Steel Town, Blues Town. Mm-hmm. But I'm not. I'm going to go with Yes, It's All Over Now. Okay, so why, why that one? I just think it's a great rock and roll ripping song about uh, the end of a relationship. And who hasn't had one of those? Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, it's, it's just a great foot stomper. And, you know, it's probably one that may not get enough attention. The last song on a record seldom gets that much attention. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's add... Yep, yeah, yes, it's out all over now to the mm-hmm. growing um, list of the songs of the playlist, following uh, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard and New from the American Wedding soundtrack. So, uh, as always, as always, there's a, a, a nice kind of mix and dip of uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> different things leading up to that. Um, and, yeah, so leading up before the next guest picks the, the 100th song for the album. So, uh, and, yeah, so that's... So that's the Broken Homes. Yes, it's all over now. Um, he's going to be... Yeah, so that's kind of the last double-digit song on the uh, on the playlist. So uh-huh. you're the, the final double-digit the final double digit song on the playlist. Um, I, will wear that, I will wear that with pride. <laughs> the last double-digit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and yeah, we're at the end of our conversation, Keith. It's been an absolute pleasure. And it's been great. If people want to find you and listen to your album, uh, abandoned albums, um, which which um, kind of it's kind of weird because usually I usually I like to take a few, about five minutes to talk about the album, the the podcast at the end, mm. but I think it's and it's been quite interesting that the because we've talked about it quite a bit of it already, um, mm. but and it's yeah. quite rare that it's kind of so linked to pick disc um, already. So um, and. Yeah. But if you wanna, but if anyone skipped all that for some strange reason, and you wanna, <laughs> and you wanna give the spiel again, want to tell the listeners uh, exactly where they can find the abandoned podcasts? Sure, you can find abandoned albums at all your favorite podcast places: Spotify, iTunes, Audible, all the rest. Abandoned albums is a uh, a podcast that tries to <clears throat> highlight albums that just may not have been paid attention to when they were initially released. Um, some of the acts you might know, some of the acts you might not know, some of the acts are up and coming that we don't want the albums to become abandoned. We are on all the social medias. At Instagram, we are at abandoned underscore albums. On the Twitter sphere, we are at abandoned albums. You can follow me individually, um, Keith R. Higgins, H-I-G-G-O-N-S. On Instagram, at Keith R. Higgins, and Twitter is at K.R. Higgins. And we have a website, AbandonedAlbums.com, where you listen to all the the, the episodes there as well. Um, yeah, and I usually write up a little synopsis on there as well, of what I'm thinking and what the experience was like recording. So that's, that's where we are in the digital realm. Yeah, um, I have to. I've 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 not had a chance to kind of listen to much yet, but um, but say so you've got an you've got an episode, the episode that you, you speak to the people about this album, and mm-hmm. yeah, so I'm I'm de- def- definitely interested in checking that out, particularly after this conversation. So, you know, I didn't want to. Uh, it's not one I wanted to do do before. It's, um, that's episode one hundred and one. Um, I've interviewed Jeff from Czar, Steve Smith from the Vapors. Uh, Vaden Todd Lewis from the Toadies. Um, we usually try to get the artist involved whenever possible. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, do check out Abandoned Albums. Um, I think it's like a very kind of interesting kind of premise, and a lot of labor, labor. It's labor of love as well. I think. Yeah, I think you find one hundred percent. Yeah, but yeah. Um, and yeah, and with that, we are we are in fact now at the end of our conversation, Keith. And again, thank you ever so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been great. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to Pick a Disc and I've been your host, Matthew Labour. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made This Podcast Network and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash We Made This. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash Pick a Disc. 
You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under Pick a Disc. You can also email us on pickadisc at gmail.com. Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Welcome to One Rules Them All, a Lord of the Rings podcast on the We Made This podcast network. Myself, Luke Winch, and my co-host Baz Greenland will be exploring the new Amazon Prime series, The Rings of Power. Week by week, we should be analysing each episode with a foray of guests. We have also been revisiting the Peter Jackson films and looking at them from a new perspective. So join us every week as we discuss the world of Tolkien and the rings of power. One podcast to rule them all. One podcast to find them. One podcast to bring them all. And on the We Made This Network, bind them.